afternoon. My name is Rabia Muhtar. I'm the executive director for the Qatar Environment and Energy Research Institute. Uh, I know that you haven't had the chance for the last three days to speak. All the panels are, all the, the time allocated to, uh, uh, to the sessions have been consumed by us talking. So I hope that today uh, or this afternoon, we will try to change that dynamic so there will be more interactive session. I will not take much time, but I'd like to, uh, before I introduce the, the uh, chairman of this uh, workshop, I'd like to probably very briefly tell you why, uh, why energy in buildings. By the way, this session title is energy in buildings, so it's not energy efficiency, it is energy in buildings. Uh, so what, what is the importance of energy in buildings? Uh, we all acknowledge that Qatar and the region are expanding unprecedented rate. If uh, I can tell you that the first time I was in Qatar with, with uh, uh, some, of, some of us have been here numerous times before I moved since January, uh, there weren't as many buildings as we have today. In fact, the only hotel that we were able to check into was the Sheraton. And as you see, for the last five, six years, unprecedented growth in terms of infrastructure and that is not only unique to Qatar. That is uh, 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 throughout the entire uh, Arabian Gulf region. The point in trying to have a focused discussion about uh, sustainability and sustainable building design stems back from the nexus, water, energy, food nexus, and mainly looking at the energy use. If you look at some of the statistics coming out of, uh, not from our institute because we're still young, but we're relying on a lot of the regional research, uh, uh, in, in mainly in Kuwait, and more recently in Saudi Arabia, over 65% of the electricity that we generate is consumed in maintaining these buildings. Uh, the material that we use is not sustainable, is not homegrown. The design that we use is imported. The building codes is imported. And there is a really need to, for all of us to sit down and start highlighting the priorities. So in the audience, I hope that we do have academics. I know many of the colleagues here in academics, but I know also that there are people who are out in the industry. Uh, I know that people in the policy that I hope some of, uh, some of you would identify yourself later and make your, your points. The idea behind building or designing this workshop, we started being more comprehensive on sustainable building, but we realized very quickly that we need to have a focus because we could not include water, we could not include wastewater, we couldn't include a lot of other uh, important items. So the discussion internally in the Institute, we decided to focus on energy. So the focus of this session is building in energy. However, we do realize that there's a water sector, there's wastewater disposal that are as important. Uh, so the idea behind building the, the, uh, the designing the workshop is to really prioritize come up with a research agenda, and I could tell you that even though I did not speak about it this morning as a research area, but it's under major activity under the, the energy footprint. So this is an area that we are building expertise in, in the Institute in Qatar, not only because we want to do it here and do the best, we want to work with all of you regionally. I'm, I'm very glad and pleased to see some of our colleagues from Kuwait and from Saudi Arabia who have been invited are, are among us, and the idea Behind the discussion today, it's not going to end today. I have a commitment from, uh, from Fahad Al Harbi. Dr. Al Harbi has committed to, communi to be the lead focal point from the Institute to go take this discussion beyond. So after today's discussion, I'm hoping that there will be a clear direction in terms of priority areas and an action plan. So don't stop at the discussion. We have two hours. It's too short of a time. But let us move beyond the priorities and identify an action plan. And I, I have my commitment from the Institute to really follow up with a, uh, the, the uh, uh, Qatari partner, with the regional partner, and with the international partner. We've got several of the Arab expat scientists among us. This could be an area in which we, are, we can develop a, a, a partnership, research partnership. We also have several of the international uh, uh, research institutions and industry among us, so please let us at, at least have a, a, an outline of what are the next steps. I'd like not to take uh, further, I'd like to introduce the chairman of the, of the session, 
Dr. Fahad Al-Harbi, who would be aided also with, with a uh, co-chair, uh, Dr. Darwish. So thank you so much, Fahad, for all the energy in putting this together. I should say start. Assalamu alaikum and welcome you all uh, in this uh, workshop. Uh, I think uh, Rabbi make the life easier. He said what should be said. Okay, so I wouldn't add a lot of points. And uh, for that, uh, please let me start uh, introducing the panelists. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Maryam Al Ali. Sorry. Okay, please. Uh, Maryam is a associate professor in physics program at Qatar University, and she is the head of material technology units office. Uh, she works in general in material science, and her main or specialty is in polymers and uh, composite characterization. Also, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Saad Al Jandal from Kuwait Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, Saad uh, is working in renewable uh, energy uh, applications in Kuwait, and uh, he's been heavily involved in this for about, should I say, how many years? I would say 20 years. Okay, and would like also uh, to welcome Alex Amato. Uh, Alex uh, has over 30 years' experience in the construction industry, and uh, he's been worked uh, with both private and public sector. Welcome, Alex. Also, uh, we have uh, Walid uh, Shakron. Uh, Walid is uh, a professor in mechanical engineering from Kuwait University, and his main area of uh, research is uh, residential uh, air conditioning. Also, we'd like to welcome Holly Chant. Uh, Holly Chant uh, uh, is a KO international, from KO International Corporate Director of Sustainability. She's been conducting a lot of uh, conduct, I mean, sustainability research in the region, and uh, some of them are really, really interesting. Okay, I would like also to welcome Iyad Mas'ad. Iyad Mas'ad is the Assistant Dean for Research and Graduate Studies and the Director of, uh, at uh, Texas A&M in Qatar. And uh, Mas'ad General Research is in characterization and modeling of infrastructure materials. Also, would like to welcome uh, John Bryant. John uh, is associate professor also in Texas A&M, and he's been uh, involved a lot with uh, energy management uh, research. I uh, would like to welcome him again. And uh, uh, the panel will be just maybe uh, directly like uh, personal opinion, I would say, of the panelist. But uh, also, uh, thanks to Dr. Said uh, has. I prepared a presentation, a short presentation about the energy consumption for, uh, I mean, footprint in Kuwait. It wouldn't be that far away from Qatar, so please, Saad, if you can. Do you have the USB? Okay, let's see. Do you have it from here? I guess so. What is it? Okay. Now, uh, Good afternoon. Uh, it's basically, it's, it's about our activities at KISER, Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, for the past few years. The issue in here is not the, uh, the uh, it's only the, the energy consumption per se, it's only uh, the, the issue of energy conservation with energy efficiency in buildings that is really in a hard and really rough environment. We have extreme heat and extreme weather, and we have to deal with it. And this is really affecting the, the countries and affecting the, 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 the way how the country really, uh, or all countries uh, really spending money onto fuel and power stations and, uh, you know, eventually affecting the, uh, the, envi uh, the environment as well. So it's basically, I just want to talk about our, our development in the energy conservation, energy con uh, conservation and buildings over the years. And I start with our vision that uh, we try to avoid the, the excess fuel consumption power stations. And we, we could, uh, with that, we could uh, use uh, some s uh, sustainable methods that could be really uh, improved in the demand side management and the energy mix in the country. Whatever uh, applies to Kuwait obviously applies to other uh,
regional uh, uh, you know, uh, countries, Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, uh, and we all more or less the same uh, profiles. We use the same technologies, and we, we suffer from the same uh, consequences. Uh, we also we have programs that we des uh, d uh, recently uh, introduced in the, our new energy center that really based on two, two programs. The energy center is based on two, two programs. The first program is renewable energy and integration with the, within the energy mix in the country as well as using renewable energy in the buildings. At the same time, we have the energy efficiency and energy uh, conservation program, which is really extension. We, we went ahead and we started two years ago with the, the two programs. But the, uh, I'm not, I want to skip on the, the aspects of, uh, because of the short time, the aspects of the energy scenario in Kuwait, but it's really it's more or less like in other countries. We have challenges, uh, challenges in the country or in the, in the region. It's really the amount of energy that's been consumed to produce electricity and water. So with that, we have to approach the, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, the energy aspects with more uh, sort of methods that really could reduce it. One of the, the, the most important uh, consumption, uh, you know, aspects in consumption buildings is the issue of air conditioning. Air conditioning really follows the, the pattern of, uh, 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 pattern of temperature rise in the country as well as the power generation starting from like uh, uh, like uh, starting like end of March until end of October the profile start to peak so you'll start to have this bill shape uh, curve that is speaking that's all due to the large consumption of energy for air conditioning that means we have to look at the gas root of the problem which is the building itself the building has been built, the, the building envelope have been constructed, what kind of material has been used, and how the, the people really use the building itself. So actually the, the demand is so high, this is the, I'm going to skip uh, this because of the, the issue, but the, uh, again, the, uh, the measures that should be taken into this, we have to look into the floor, uh, insulation, the increase in basic, basic message, uh, me uh, measures in the, in the building. We have to look into those technologies in more detail and see, see how they could be applied in the, in the right way. The shading devices in the building, we have to look at it more seriously. Uh, we have to look at also to efficient uh, appliances and more efficient lighting systems and the, the building use at, uh, itself from the, the, the how it's been used. Not every building can be used for different function. Every building is meant for uh, a purpose and has to be followed. So another, uh, another, uh, you know, another word. It's the the building has to be looked at it as it's not like a human being, but it's it's a, it's something that should be treated carefully. Our recent studies at Kisar, at least, we, we concentrated on the development of the, uh, the, the code and the uh, code of practice for the building has been used. We looked at the building structure, building envelope, the, the, the type of materials. We, we uh, looked at the, the different aspects of the building, the, the bridges, the columns, the, the walls, and the, the, uh, the design, the architecture aspects of it more detailed and we, we try to make models that could be implemented in the, uh, the development of the model, uh, the code of practice, as well as the, the uh, you know, uh, the, the Gulf. Now we have the, the Gulf code of practice. We looked at the, the uh, code of practice from two, two main components, the building component itself and the HVAC uh, application and control systems. With all of these, there are many, um, many, uh, many aspects and case studies we, we was uh, it was done, and the uh, the uh, the application of that led to the the first code of practice in Kuwait, 1983, and then now we followed. We just issued the last year the the latest. Uh, 
code of practice in the buildings, which is, was implemented by the, the ministry as a uh, guideline for both the, the public and the private sector to implement. This is the latest uh, code of practice for energy conservation as well a body of the, the GCC now is being considered as a, the GCC code of practice and it will be uh, issued soon. Basically, as I said, you know, there are aspects of the building envelope and all of this. I want to skip a few comparison, but I thought the uh, Dr. Fahad, uh, so he asked me to cut down. The, I want to conclude with the, this part of the world is really energy intensive. Those, these buildings, they take a lot of energy to cool. So we have to look at it from really seriously because it's affecting a country, a small country like Kuwait is spending like eight billion or six to eight billion uh, dollars a year on fueling power stations. This is cannot be sustained, cannot be, uh, uh, you know, uh, continue the way it's been done. The, we have to look at the situation of from the, the technology part, from the policy and planning uh, part, from the, the codes and practices for, uh, parts. So the, the issue in here, we have to take it seriously and the, 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 the role of the research institute is really to provide those guidelines for the, the, the decision makers that will make the implementation easier. So with that, uh, the, we ha those codes or these studies, ha they have to be enforced and they were enforced in, in the right way. That's why we re re resorted to the codes and now we have the introducing the, the Gulf Code soon by I think next year is going to be implemented for all air conditioning buildings. Also, we have to improve in our uh, approach and to as really look into more sustainable features in the buildings which are more uh, difficult uh, to implement, uh, more in, uh, you know, approach of uh, the issues of uh, uh, the landscaping and we know, you know, this part of the world doesn't have that much landscaping. It's all artificial, unfortunately, but it's the issue here. We have to look at the, the right trees to be uh, put around the buildings, the right uh, structure, the right shading uh, to be implemented. These are, we're gonna look at it in the future. So hopefully that, uh, you know, will be implemented. But the, the, uh, once again, you know, the role of research is used to do studies and implement them and recommend them to the, uh, uh, you know, to decision makers. I think with that, I'll, I think I'll stop. Maybe the discussion will continue. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Saad. <laughs> and since Saad talked about the I mean, energy footprint in uh, Kuwait, let's start with the footprint in Qatar. Maybe John uh, have done some work in the energy management and would like to elaborate on that? Well, uh, sure, if you want. Yeah. So let's also rush it. Sorry. Okay. So I'll put it up here. Ah. <laughs> okay, you have to pretend you didn't see that. I have a, my 225 slide presentation. Um, <laughs> What, what the gentleman from Quay was just talking about, and if any of you are involved with building sciences or, or have done modeling, if you're on the consulting side, um, trying to figure out what the load for a building is, um, even if, you, if you've ever lived in a house or worked in a building, you know that there's kind of a flow to the energy in the building. Um, and like you said, in the, we, conceptually, we're pretty sure it's going to be, for this part of the world, uh, the highest load in the middle of summer, probably more in August because we have a high humidity load then as well, and probably the lowest um, been when it's cool out because we don't have as much air conditioning, and this is a predominantly uh, cooling-driven uh, climate. Uh, at Texas A&M, we did, uh, we were, uh, was fortunate to be one of the, in the first round of the Cutter National Research Foundation uh, awardees, and we looked at, uh, we have a research program, it's just wrapping up, in fact, my final report is due in three days, uh, so I should be working on that to uh, look at variable air volume systems. And we were looking specifically at boxes, uh, the, the terminal units on these variable air volume boxes. But to help understand how these systems would improve mechanical systems inside buildings in this climate, 
Uh, one of my students uh, did some work here. We uh, installed some electrical metering on our building. We installed some chilled water metering on the building. We could take uh, every 15 minutes during the day for about a year. We took that kind of data for the building. So with that in mind, let's see, you've already seen the one thing is our chilled water uh, curve here. Let's see that I and and sure enough, it, it does kind of what we thought it would do. Is and the cooler parts of the year here with low loads, it doesn't matter what since some of those gigajoules, uh, gigajoules on one side, we've got BTUs times 10 to the sixth on this side, and it, it's kind of skewed the distribution to August, September, July, just like kind of what you would think it would be. So you would think, wow, the, the electrical load in the building must really peak with those times of the year as well. But it's also attached to us. We occupy the buildings. We go in and out of these buildings, and if we have a lot of people in the buildings, we add load. We, we want lights on. Uh, we have computers that we use at the desks, et cetera. Those all add to the loads, plug loads, internal loads to the building. And normally, really, large buildings like what we have, a lot of the large buildings, especially institutional buildings in, in Doha, are uh, internally load-driven more so than external. So uh, Mitch, my grad student, also did this. And this is a really wonderful graph. And what it's got, there's, there's six curves on here. But in general, the top two here that go across are mild weather, high occupancy, hot weather, high occupancy. So when we have high occupancy from 8 o'clock in the morning till about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, everybody's going home. What you can see is that diurnal, that daily swing of electrical use. And this is electrical use in the building. And it goes from about 1 megawatt up to about a peak of close to 13, 1,250 megawatts, uh, 1,250 kW, so 1 1.2 megawatts. Um, what's interesting, though, is just look at the middle ones, kind of the beige color here, and that's hot weather with medium occupancy, mild weather. And what we did was split it into the hot time of the year, the summer, and our mild, which is the cool, you know, the January, February months. And again, what we see is it's much more seems to be driven by electrical use, by occupancy, as opposed to weather. And we look at the low, I mean, weather has an impact, but it's uh, the last one here, the, last, the bottom two, um, the kind of red and the blue, are mild weather and low occupancy and hot weather and, and low occupancy. So it's the occupancy that seems to be driving the load in our particular building. When we put those two curves together, we convert the chill water usage into uh, joules or, or into kilowatt hours. Uh, this curve essentially flattens out for the whole year because our chill water is provided by the central energy plant, just like this building is a central energy plant that provides all the chill water for the building. Including that electrical usage into our signature uh, makes for a very flat signature. So that's what's disturbing. And you say, well, what can we do? We need to start looking at that because the basic electrical signature for our building is one megawatt. Regardless if there's people in our building or not, we're running that thing 24-7 at a baseline of one megawatt, which is a huge amount of, of energy in an empty building. Because this is saying low occupancy, low to nobody in the building, we still run the building at one megawatt, which is really a disturbing result. I mean, it had nothing to do with my VAV research particularly, but it's something that came from research, which is you never exactly know where you're going to end up when you, you start on some of these projects. So I think it's a, a real um, kickoff for what can, what, what can we do in terms of uh, post-occupancy evaluation or getting a high-performance building. Uh, continuous commissioning is another topic that this launches off into because this is about a five-year-old building, six-year-old building. And we, we've got some operational problems evidently in here. Or how else can we explain our, our one megawatt um, peak? So there's some really interesting things going on there. And so with that, oh, I can minimize this. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Okay. It's really interesting. I mean, it's really alarming number. When you say 1,400 or 1.4 megawatt for a single building, this is really huge. huge. It is a huge. So, Alex, I mean, does that go with if we're talking about sustainable or sustainability future? How that goes? I mean, for a single building to spend 1.4 megawatts. Well, um, I, I, uh, John and I have been uh, talking about. Um, <clears throat> this issue of um, uh, uh, the effect of occupancy um, and I'd, I'd, uh, of, of even sustainable buildings. And I'd like to uh, relate a, 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 a short story to emphasize this. Um, uh, there was a, um, a recent uh, a conference in, in, in the UK, uh, uh, a gathering really of, of uh, uh, sustainability uh, 
construction uh, professionals uh, to look at, at uh, uh, building performance. And uh, one architect, a very uh, renowned uh, uh, architectural practice that had carried out uh, sustainable and energy efficient buildings for uh, many, many years, um, was, was deeply shocked and embarrassed when he stood up and uh, reported to the audience that in fact they had modeled uh, the building uh, and found uh, after returning to it for five years, after five years occupancy, that their modeling and expected energy performance of the building was out by 100%. Um, so uh, rather uh, uh, embarrassed about this, he later learned that in fact his performance was actually quite good because others were out by 500%. So there is uh, a, a great deal um, which we uh, as yet really do not understand about um, uh, the difference, if you like, between the, uh, as professionals, uh, uh, when, as design professionals, when we model our buildings and work out our uh, design intent, the, the energy expenditure, uh, as far as that is concerned, and then the, the, the reality is really quite different. And getting to the bottom of that, I think, is extremely uh, 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 important as far as uh, here in, 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 the, uh, in the Gulf region is concerned. Much of it uh, has to do with uh, the uh, um, uh, 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 efficiency uh, of our facilities management operations. But a lot of it has also to do with really understanding user behavior. Um, and uh, that, uh, we do hope, is <laughs> going to be a, a future of our uh, uh, rather uh, a future research uh, um, proposal uh, that we intend to submit uh, in, the, uh, in the fifth round of the NPRP. Um, I, I, would, I would like to just m uh, make one point, and that there's nothing really wrong with energy, and we shouldn't um, uh, have too much angst about it. Really, we're interested in the impacts of how we generate energy. So really, the emphasis, I think, as far as measurement is concerned, should certainly focus on, on CO2 and CO2 equivalents uh, as defined in the uh, Kyoto Protocol. And I think that it's most important to, to point that out because obviously um, energy generated from clean uh, sources has a very different environmental profile and indeed materials too, uh, which are generated uh, non from non-fossil fuel bases have a very different environmental product uh, uh, impact uh, than, than um, uh, 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 similar materials that have been uh, produced from, from fossil, from uh, uh, energy using fossil fuels. So um, uh, I think that, uh, um, uh, if you like, the emphasis must be looking at um, uh, focusing on, on CO2. It's a robust indicator of other environmental impact and I think that is the key point uh, that is the really the the, the the crux that we're trying to to um, uh, uh, if you like produce a built environment that is extremely uh, or reduces those impacts uh, and, and a number of other impacts uh, as well including uh, um, uh, impacts on biodiversity uh, abiotic resource depletion etc so it's uh, it, when we do talk about energy, I think we just need to reflect sometimes uh, that really we're interested in the impacts, not so much the, the, uh, the, the energy itself, but obviously um, focusing on energy conversation, co conservation is extremely important and part of that whole, uh, um, if you like, life cycle assessment of the built environment. Okay. Thank you, Alex. And I'll get away from the CEO for the time being, but uh, I'll get back to uh, Walid. Uh, apparently, AC is the main consumer giant for electricity in the region, and the CEO also in the world. Uh, how do you see the future to mitigate such consumption? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think this, this issue of energy uh, conservation uh, should start, I believe, uh, up front when we introduce uh, the energy, it was mentioned earlier. Okay. 
uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, you know whether if we, if we if we produce energy from solar for example is a bit different than if we produce it from from fossil fuel uh, i believe there is a lot of energy conservation could be done at that level we could really improve the power stations there is a lot of you know techniques to improve really the efficiency of the power stations transmitting the energy from the power stations to the houses also is a huge loss in there and a lot of issues could be done in there and i believe also stability of the network is a big concern, especially when we start adding this renewable energy and the photovoltaics in the house and so on. Coming to the house, building envelopes is a big issue, of course. Applying code and standards, of course, is very important. However, we should really be careful about that. By applying the wrong code and standards, we may be doing some harm to the, to the building environments. I think an effort should be done in Qatar or in the Gulf areas to come up with a unique code. I think it was mentioned by Dr. Saad that uh, unique code should be done for this part of the world. Now the code also is an issue that which building we're talking about, we're talking about houses for example, low residential houses, the code should be different than if we talk about high rise buildings and even high performance buildings. Because I cannot really put a control system in residential houses, the compliance will not be uh, important and, and I think we lose a lot of issues, spending a lot of money where we do not need it. I believe also, the culture has to be changed. If I ask every one of us here how much your building consumes energy, very few would answer. But if I ask how much your car consumes energy, probably all of us would know how much. This technique of building labelings should be also come in very harsh on this part of the world. Why again? Because energy conservation is very the highest here. And really we have, in my view, it is a challenge, but it's a big opportunity. We, have, we, we know success stories in buildings. So I guess if we do a good job here, we could conserve you know, as much as 70% of the energy that's been consumed in buildings. I believe culture has to be changed. Again, if we put the, you know, the, 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 the nicest building, the very efficient building, but the people do not really care for the energy much, they open the windows, and then they do not really care about energy conservation, water conservation, of course, we do not do much. I think all this together, should be coupled with, 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 you know, together in my view, to come up very nicely with a very efficient system. HVAC systems, the rating of HVAC system is very important and, and, and add more complexity to the problem. The refrigerant that's been used in the HVAC systems is also a big concern to this part of the world. We cannot find the best refrigerant to use in this high ambient temperatures. You know, Montreal Protocol has been phasing out, you all know, CFCs, HCFCs, and they are bringing now HFCs to be used. And we found out that this HFC is also the global warming potential gas. So it has to be phased out with time. What, is, what gas do we need to put in this part of the world? This is something that I do not have an answer for, neither the United Nations nor any other professional societies. A test, research has, been, it has to be done to look holistically at the whole HVAC systems, see how it performs under this refrigerants, how it really consumes energy, and how really you know, the be it behaves under different refrigerant systems. So I guess, you know, just highlighting the issues, uh, Dr. Rabia, he wants to have some, some conclusion out of this uh, session, and I think we have really concentrate on the uh, things and how to improve further the building efficiency. Okay, thanks, Walid. And definitely, I think the culture is really an important factor here. Well, I think you started or found a program in Dubai or like a public awareness starting from women and families, if you can elaborate on that a little, please. Sure, I'd be delighted to. Um, first off, I'd like to actually ask the audience a question, please. How many people turn their water heater off and on every day based on their usage? Actually, that's, that's good. A lot of people don't even know where their water heater is. <laughs> it, how, yes, how many from the region? That's a very good point, who understand. Okay. Well, the reason I wanted to ask you all this question was it was these type of questions that actually led a group of colleagues of mine and myself to launch a group uh, in the UAE called the Eco Chicks. And the purpose of the group was to uh, do advocacy to women to empower them to understand sustainability in the home and by empowering the women to also give them an ability to teach their children about uh, energy conservation and also 
the really, really critical relationship between energy conservation and public health. Because we've, we felt that if you could teach a woman that her child that suffered from asthma might be benefited by maintaining the HVAC system in her home, by cleaning the filters if there were pods on the wall or whatever type of system it was, that through understanding the systems in the house that the symptoms of the children's illness might be relieved. Uh, the UAE has just chronic asthma in children. I believe Kuwait is also similarly afflicted. It's very common with the particulate matter in the, the air here and the fact that we live inside so much of the year. Uh, so through the group, um, we started doing outreach uh, not only to women and children uh, that were local women and also expatriate women, but we also targeted their housekeepers. And how could we empower people that were staff and homes to understand simple things like turning off water heaters every day was a good action that they should be praised for, that washing the pavement every day was not a good action, but that required education of the entire family so that the housemaid wouldn't be necessarily reprimanded if her front walk wasn't perfectly clean. These are very simple actions, but a lot of women, uh, if they don't work in the professional world or in academia, never have any exposure whatsoever to these elements. And we believed uh, that all of these technological means to sustainability were very, very important, but without addressing the human element of people who aren't technical, but are the end users of technologies and the home and obviously energy that we were missing a really, really critical piece. Um, so my advocacy was based on observations in the Middle East that were then confirmed through academic research I did uh, as well as part of my uh, master's degree thesis. I did a mid-career uh, uh, degree at Harvard University. I'm happy one of my professors is here in the audience today. And what I focused on in my research was why policy on energy was failing based on slow-moving institutions. So when I, when I use that term, I mean regulations and laws are fast institutions, but slow-moving are social norms. And the very same changes that you need to make for housewives, children, um, any home user, it doesn't just have to be a housewife, that slow change is very, you can really identify that slow change as something that stymies our efforts also in policy making. So uh, I guess I, as a closing remark, I would just like to say that meaningful change is definitely encouraged with technology and expertise and engineering, but if you don't look at the human factor as well, that very slow moving change, we, we aren't grasping the entire complex problem of sustainability and sustainable development. Thank right. you. Thank you, Ali. And since we talk about education, I think we'll move to Maryam. And uh, some uh, academic entities start, I mean, establishing programs for sustainability, just for sustainability or renewable energy usage and things like that. Uh, and I think there is one in the region, if I'm not mistaken, it's Ajman. Uh, is there any plan on Qatar University, or how do you see that should go, other than going to the conventional academic structure? Uh, Qatar University is one of the largest uh, universities in Qatar. It has uh, more than 9,000 students, 70% of them are girls, and 70 of them uh, are locals. Uh, we have an environmental program, and um, two environmental masters, one in engineering and one in uh, science. And uh, sustainability is also included even in uh, social sciences. We have one chair uh, from Shell for sustainability in social sciences. So sustainability is included in every program uh, in a way uh, that uh, the program needs it. Um, but I will go to another track, the material track, if you allow me. Sure. Okay. Materials is one of the most uh, important issues when we um, discuss uh, enviro uh, en energy and, um, uh, and uh, building. 
there are uh, many types of materials that can be used to reduce uh, the energy loss. Recycling materials uh, is not used in the region. Um, the waste in Qatar and the GCC country is 60% uh, 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 composites, natural waste, 15% polymers, 12% paper. Nobody is using these uh, materials. So in Qatar University, there is a strong program now uh, for recycling polymers, for recycling papers. Part of it is uh, awareness program we are starting with high school students and uh, of course Qatar University students and other universities in Qatar. Uh, this is a strong program. Uh, the idea behind this program is to include recycling materials as a semi constructional material. So it is used instead of wood, instead uh, of uh, some types of steel, and uh, of course recycling uh, papers which is very important in this region. Also corrosion. Corrosion uh, causes uh, much loss of energy in this region, uh, not in uh, buildings only but also for the industry. Uh, another important issue is um, using uh, phase change materials. Phase change materials is, uh, has never been used in Qatar and in the region. Um, as I know, there is no research programs discussing these phase change materials. You can use even wood, date palm fiber uh, as a phase change material, of course, after uh, mixing it with um, appropriate matrix like um, polypropylene or uh, high density polyethylene. One important thing that we are implementing uh, in Qatar at the moment is uh, regulations. Uh, DR, uh, uh, Research Institute, now called Gulf Institute for Research, uh, has uh, established a program called QSAS, which is uh, forced by the government uh, to be used for all governmental uh, uh, buildings and for uh, very big complexes and towers. So we have already started this and uh, many uh, countries in the region are discussing this with Qatar at the moment. Life cycle assessment using uh, general softwares like Gabi4 for example can be used. Uh, to assist materials used for buildings. But one important issue to remember that you have to redesign the software again according to your needs. So for Qatar University, for example, for example, we started modified, actually started from zero approximately the software, what the new parameters needed for Qatar, and we assess now mostly all materials in Qatar, from life, from life to landfill. Uh, there are, of course, uh, other important issues uh, like solar cells. Uh, what type of solar cell to use? Uh, is it okay for Qatar? What about the dust? What about the um, fog, the um, humidity, uh, other parameters, the design? of the solar cells my colleagues are working on, Dr. Saud here, and uh, shades, as um, my colleague from Kuwait said. There are um, uh, the building design, architecture. I know that there is a strong uh, architecture program at Qatar University and dealing with uh, these issues at the moment. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you, Mariam. And since we talk about material, are talking about materials, maybe he had to elaborate more. I mean, for the region has, a sp I mean, different requirements than maybe what's in many other uh, places in the world. For example, I guess uh, the standard for solar cell is to go from minus 40 to plus 40. It would be easy here for to jump for the temperature to be more than plus 40. So what would be the requirements 
for the to, I mean for the materials to fit uh, Qatari or the GCC region uh, environments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fahad, and uh, thanks for query for the opportunity to speak in uh, this panel. Actually, I would like to uh, organize my remarks in uh, three categories. I'm going to speak about uh, framework, framework for the problem because I work in construction materials. So my focus is going to be uh, close to the focus of Dr. Maryam in terms of energy consumed in construction materials and making the construction materials and then bringing it to site to make these buildings. The next uh, item I'm going to focus on is opportunities in Qatar to bring the problem home because I've been working with agencies in Qatar on issues related to construction materials. And then, frankly, I'm going to talk to you about challenging in Qatar in implementing some of the work that uh, you can come up with as a researcher in this area. So to frame uh, the problem, um, quick uh, numbers to uh, put it in framework is uh, the construction industry in general is uh, responsible for about 40% of the use of global extracted materials. It utilizes 35% of energy in the world and are directly responsible for 35% of global emissions. So it's a huge use of uh, materials, the construction industry, but also causes a lot of damage through these emissions. Embodied energy in these buildings, which is the direct and indirect energy that went into making these massive concrete buildings uh, can be divided into two parts. The direct energy is the energy that takes you to construct the building from the materials once they arrive here. And that's only 10% of the total energy. The remaining the major percentage, which is the 90%, is the indirect energy that uh, went into making these materials. Um, so these materials are uh, uh, very energy incentive uh, to produce and to uh, these buildings take a lot of energy to build. For example, uh, as you know, in, in the concrete, 90%, 10% of the concrete is made up of cement. And that cement, it has been estimated that uh, production of one ton of Portland cement results in one ton of carbon dioxide. So it, is, it cannot be underestimated, these percentages. So that's about uh, the, uh, what it takes to make uh, these buildings and the energy that goes into making these buildings. Now let's bring the issue home, Qatar. Uh, of course, it's, it's known that Qatar is using a lot of construction materials. For example, I got this statistic from the Qatar Customs Database. In 2006, 9.5 million tons were imported to Qatar Rock to make this building. In 2008, it was 21.5 million tons. I couldn't get the numbers for 2010 or 2011. But we are doubling the numbers. I think it's going to be exponentially increasing. Now, uh, an important issue here, what, what is the solution? So what are the opportunities? We are demolishing a lot of buildings in Qatar. Uh, this is numbers I got from uh, the municipality and from uh, Public Works Authority. It has been estimated that around 20,000 tons per day of demolished waste is added in Qatar. And that is total, currently we have 7.3 million tons of waste material in Qatar. A lot of this can be reused and recycled into buildings and roads. In fact, our studies that we did, uh, uh, studies on this, uh, not laboratory studies, but uh, literature review and looking at other people experiences, we can reuse 30% of these materials back into building safety. Because the materials that are re -demol demolished in Qatar actually have quality materials. And we can recycle them, clean them, clean them. And there are companies in Qatar who do that up to a point of use. So that is the opportunity. The opportunity that we have a lot of recycling that we can do the quality materials back into a building and save significant amount of energy. So what is the challenge? The challenge is in the human factor, and it's in the fear of implementation. I think there is significant resistance in some circles where it's very hard to implement these technologies, even proven technologies. I'm not talking about very innovative technologies. I'm talking about proven technologies into a standard. In my world, in the construction world, we are driven by standards and specifications. We are innovative, we like innovation, we push innovative, but if it's not in the book as a standard, 
will not be used. It has to be in a spec book. And unfortunately, there's a lot of resistance in using these technologies in terms of materials, in terms of recycling, proven materials into the spec in order to make more efficient buildings, more efficient roads, with less virgin materials, more recycled materials that will save a significant amount of energy. I hope that there will be more push towards policy making in Qatar, towards linking the innovative part and the research part more to uh, take it to implementation through working with the organizations in Qatar that are in charge of the implementation phase, the ones who should put it in the spec book so we can uh, be able to uh, use it. I have a lot of data in hand if you are interested after the meeting that's very recent, 2010-2011, on energy utilization in different type of materials. As Dr. Maryam said, she's absolutely right. There are a lot of options for different materials, for recycling of even conventional materials that the data shows that we can save 30% of the energy that, that goes into making these construction materials. It just needs the policy making for it to happen. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. And uh, I mean, the issue of CO2 is uh, getting back again and again. And uh, for that, actually, I'll ask uh, our distinguished uh, visitor, uh, John Spengler, is uh, from the Environment Department in Harvard University. Uh, CO2, I mean, control wouldn't be a single state job. Can you please come in? Uh, and there are 193 countries in the world. I have to believe that they will never reach an agreement. What do you think about this? You're asking me to, to solve something they couldn't solve in Cancun or couldn't solve in uh, Copenhagen, <laughs> and I have to solve it right here? Yeah, just give me okay. a look at <laughs> Well, on CO2, I, I'm afraid we're going to have a much hotter world. And uh, my faculty friends at Harvard that pay attention to this, we're going to go right through 450 worldwide. We're going to head for 550. And this is going to be a hot world. And on, on CO2, I want to share some very recent work that just came out of the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories and uh, friends out there doing indoor air work and they collaborated with a uh, person doing neuroscience work from Syracuse, and they tested the effects on neurocognitive processing. How do we solve higher order decision making in our brains? And they did this at CO2 levels of 600, CO2 levels at 1500, and CO2 levels at, 20, at 2500. No, I think it was 1,000, I think. They had demonstrable effects of diminished central nervous system, higher order cognitive functioning at 2,500, and effects, similar effects, but not nearly as severe at around 1,000 to 1,500. Levels we find in our buildings all the time. So that gets back to a question. So let me just give a little background. So my field has been in environmental health, and I've been doing air pollution health work for a number of years, a lot of outdoor work, but my, in the last 20 years, it's focused on indoor environments, looking at cigarette smoke and nitrogen dioxide and ozone reactions to form aldehydes, uh, asbestos, fiberglass, pesticides, and now more recently interested in, in the issues of modern chemicals like plasticizers and flame retardants that are in all of our products. Um, so let me just say what we do know. And I'm going to take a different focus. I'm going to say we have buildings, and we have buildings with energy uh, consumption for ventilation and air cleaning uh, for a purpose. And the purpose is us and for us and our functionality. Uh, but we do know that we're spending 90% of our time worldwide, all of us, indoors, in some built environment. We know that the indoor air pollution for many compounds, combustion products, emission, gases emissions from consumer products, uh, chemicals from those things, things that we apply ourselves, moisture and molds can be many high, times higher indoors than outdoors. And we know that there are health consequences for that. So I just served on a uh, scientific committee for ASHRAE. Some of you know uh, ASHRAE, it's the ventilation uh, standards. Uh, and we were asked to look at the relationship between <laughs> infectious disease and ventilation. And sure enough, we saw, and now even new literature is saying there's a strong relationship. 
that our current ventilation standards could be improved. We should be using more ventilation, not less, more, uh, to reduce the uh, transmission between people, to improve the, uh, the uh, moisture control and, and dilute some of the pollutants we produce. So we know ventilation uh, needs to be improved. We know that sick building syndrome increases with the use of air conditioning. There are numerous studies that show the presence of air conditioning increased the symptoms that people are reporting in buildings. Um, we know productivity is related to these environmental factors. Chamber studies shown it, and then building studies on call centers and other places where they look at task performance. You put more pollutants in, you lower the ventilation, people's performance drops down. So it all ties together. And now we have the issue of, um, of climate change upon us. And, and I think this has an impact in a couple of ways. One, we will do things to our buildings to mitigate the effect of climate change. We'll try to re energy efficiency. A lot of that energy efficiency is to tighten up the structure and drive the ventilation rates down. But humidities go up inside. Therefore, you have a moisture problems. We've seen all these mistakes. Air quality goes down if we aren't thoughtful about this. And the second thing is that as if we think we're going to achieve the same thermal comfort conditions in our buildings today and have those buildings operate on a climate of 20 years from now, we're going to have more energy input. And we've done the modeling. We've taken buildings and run the energy future models out. And you will go out 30 years, you're paying 25% more to, to maintain that same environment inside uh, because of the, the forces go. So uh, let me just have four things. And so what I think need, we might need to work on. Great ideas. I love this issue of embodied energy. I like this issue of recycling. In fact, we took a building at Harvard, renovate, totally renovated a 100-year-old building, and all the things we took out of it, including the asphalt, 99% of the mass was recycled into another product. It just takes a will to do this. Um, so number one, I think we have, we're burdened by the discovery of, of uh, Carrier uh, 100 years ago, air conditioning ventilation systems. And we have to move to systems that decouple our ventilation requirements from our thermal requirements. Right now, our thermal and ventilation is coming through the same system. Uh, but you can build radiant systems, right? We do it already. Uh, you can separate these two fundamental processes and have cleaner air at the rates that we need and then provide your cooling and heating uh, by radiant uh, systems or, or heat storage. Phase change materials can, can be a great help there. Um, I think I like this, John, your analysis of performance of buildings. So performance has to now couple not only the mechanical performance, energy mechanical system, but occupant performance. So we need to couple these researches. And oftentimes you find the engineering doing one thing and people over in the health looking at other inputs or outcomes and not putting this together. They have to be done together. Um, product labeling. So you, you're talking about labeling buildings. This is catching on. We're seeing it done in other parts of the world. I think the UK has this in, is, we'll see how it changes the market. But if you have a building, just like a car, how, how efficient is that building? I think is important. But I think, I think we've seen other countries do product labeling, emission testing from products. Denmark, Norway, Japan, Germany. And now there's a European effort to unify this. So we have materials we buy that go into our buildings, consumer products we buy, we will know the emissions from those things. We'll know the chemicals that they put into the air. And, and right now, the companies will not tell you that. And it has to, it has to be forced to, to get at that information. And the last thing, I think we got to look at this issue of uh, vulnerability of our infrastructure to climate change and, the, and how to think forward and put in as a building design feature adaptation. Those buildings will be here 30, 40, 50 years. The climate that they'll face, the sea level rise, the precipitation patterns, the droughts that they face are different than historic climate rec records. And we've really got to look at our infrastructure in a different way. So my remarks, uh, I hope I added something. Oh, and by the way, 
So we just finished a, nat a National Academy of Science report. I chaired this committee on indoor, on climate change, indoor environments, and health. And Robbie, I, I would like to give you a copy of this. And if you want to pass it on to the libraries of some of these schools, that'd be great. I have a few summary brochures of that, um, of that, of the committee's reports looking at populations that are vulnerable, looking at systems that are vulnerable, and the interaction of climate change on indoor environments. Not part of the conversation until this report started, that came out. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Also, I'd like to thank everybody in the panel, I mean, the panelists here, and apologize for uh, the short time. I'm sure that every one of you would have more to add, but... Uh, Can you make some comments, please? Sure. I was about to open that. No, 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 for sure. Uh, we'll have actually the time for a few questions. Yeah, I so, yeah, sure. Uh, we'll have uh, more, I mean, time for questions. So please, everybody, just introduce yourself and, uh, the, I mean, state to, to whom you will uh, direct the question, please. Sattar Tai from uh, Executive Director for QNRF. Uh, well, thank you all. I'd like to thank all the panelists actually for their very interesting uh, presentations. However, I've noticed that most or all of them, they ignore the very important factor, and that is the economic factor. Let me explain. What, what will make me say for uh, Dr. Saad, if I want to build a new house, why should I use uh, thermal insulation and invest a lot of money if the electricity is free for me? So, uh, the, and the same is true with, um, you know, we need to really also play uh, or impose certain things on the electricity. And also we give incentives for people to, um, uh, to conserve energy. I know, say, for example, you, you, uh, our colleague over there, she talked about... Uh, the United Arab Emirates. Actually, I was surprised uh, one day I visited a colleague of mine. He's an, he's an expat. And I went to his uh, uh, flat, and he was uh, switching on all the air conditioning. I said, why are you doing that? He said, it's very expensive for the expat. So here you are. This is the driving force for you. And that's why I know Dr. Uh, Omar al Nashai is a very uh, great uh, person in environmental protection. But believe you me, when he also, he raised his hand because he switched off, because he's also worried about the bill, the electricity bill. So uh, regarding all of you, I think you have missed this very important factor is the tariff and the, the economic returns. One last item for um, uh, Dr. Walid. Uh, I could not really understand your concern about the alternative refrigerants. Uh, why, why should we have our own? Because already the... Uh, the Montreal Protocol, and we have the list, and we all know which is the equivalent for. But anyway, so that's uh, in a nutshell. Can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, yes, through Montreal Protocol, came out with the phasing plan for some of the refrigerants. Now they put alternatives, which is HFC. Under a different protocol, Kyoto Protocol, there are also questions HFC because it is not a greenhouse gas. It's adding to the global warming. Now, there is a substitute is really not there for our, for our region. In Europe, they've been using 134, they've been using other refrigerants. For our region, there is no substitute. If we go with HFCs, 134A and, and, and 410, they're not efficient uh, refrigerants. They're very expensive, they're not efficient for, for our temperature. So this study has to be done for our region to come up with What's the best, not, not, not create a new refrigerant, but really do analysis, assessment for some of the refrigerants that have been used for our region, what's the best refrigerant to use? That's what I meant by that. So we're not, we're not creating a new one. No, no one knows what the answer is. In my view, we should go back to nature. Natural refrigerants should be the ones we use, in my view. But this is something you have to be seen and you have to be tested. So this is what I'm saying. A new research has to be done to assess refrigerants in this part of the world, which is 48 degrees C and 46 degrees C. The behavior of the machine, the efficiency of the machine goes down by 30% when it goes from 35 to 46 degrees C. So with the new refrigerants, 
this severity is going to be even more. So what, what should we do in this regard? 70% of our energy on air conditioning in a sense. So can you imagine this decrease in efficiency, how much it's going to cost us, uh, you know, energy-wise? So this is the issue that we really have to look for. I think uh, I, I just want to explain, I think I like, you know, the idea of indoor air quality. Just one thing. In our houses, in the summertime, when the house, when the air conditioning system does not really perform well, we call the technician, he comes down, he goes up, he closes the return. So we do have, in our part of the world, 0% fresh air, in a sense, during the summertime. Talking about indoor air quality, yes, I agree with you, lots of work has to be done in there, in this part of the world. Because energy is on the cost of our health. If we improve energy, ventilation should go down. Therefore, people should be paying from their health. I agree with you, definitely. So this is a new line of research in the air quality for this part of the world again. Those are unique problems. No one understands them more than we do in this part of the region. So I think this is our role as, as centers of research and funding to really come up with an answer for that. Okay. Also, I, I appreciate, I think, it's a given that it, the best driver for uh, sustainability is economies, but in the Gulf region, in any uh, rentier economy, this, uh, there's an entitlement to energy that is uh, a fairly entrenched institution. In Abu Dhabi, uh, for an expat or an Emirati, energy is, <coughs> is practically free. In Dubai, you do pay for it, and there are expats who are much more conservative. Uh, part of the, uh, I think, of the beauty of teaching people about the relationship be about public health and indoor environmental quality uh, is that that's a, a, a stimulus that is uh, very pure. No one can take away a, a mother's concern for her child's health. It's, it's, it's a very pure uh, motivation. And um, I, I hope that the governments around the Gulf will see that there is a a great benefit to eliminating uh, petroleum entitlement to lower costs of energy, but I don't, at least in Abu Dhabi, that is not anywhere in the near future. I think it's, it, they've been talking about it as long as I've lived there, I'd say it's at least five to 10 years out before they change anything about how uh, energy is, is priced, particularly in light of the political situation in the, the region, so. Um, Thank you. I think Saad has something. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I very quickly just wanted to, to, to follow up on, on what Holly was saying. Um, uh, in that we ha have a region where we are, um, well, I suppose it, it could extend to the whole world. I mean, it is really a question of, of pricing externalities uh, that economists are, 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 are facing and we're not pricing those externalities uh, particularly well uh, and certainly not really uh, in respect of the real impacts. Um, and that is particularly so uh, as far as uh, the Gulf region is concerned where energy is uh, not, uh, if you like, the real cost of, of energy is not being priced. Um, but there are, I think there is a great deal of, of of, of hope as well. I don't think that it is entirely necessary to, um, uh, if you like, deeply upset the economic equation as far as pricing of, of energy is concerned here. Because I think that there are a number of other economic instruments that, that could be brought to, 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 to bear. Um, one of those, I think, is a, a, an assessment that we hope to undertake at the Qatar Green Building Council. Uh, in the in the near future, which looks at the opportunity cost uh, of of uh, of energy conservation, for example, energy conservation uh, that we might save and it might well be low hanging fruit, which is pretty cost effective. We know uh, this: this insulation, well sealed buildings, etc., making sure our uh, air conditioning is is efficient. Savings there might cost very or, or cost a great deal less in terms of the energy saved, which we could then sell in the international market. Now, if there's a differential there, and I suspect that there might be a significant differential there, then that alone could fund a great deal of energy conservation work. Um, so there are creative ways, I think, that, 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 uh, um, uh, that we could bring economic instruments to, 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 to bear. Uh, I would... Uh, just like to 
go back to the question of, of CO2 and CO2 equivalents, because I think that this is particularly Im Im important. We might even look at um, CO2 e benchmarking our buildings. And, uh, and there's a great deal of pride in where maybe your building is as a driver. Is it there? Are you in the bad group if we publish this? Uh, maybe there are no names, but you yourself know exactly where you are in the benchmark. And if you can then go down, then there is a great deal of, of um, uh, kudos as far as corporate and social responsibility, which is a, which is a real driver and is a real driver for, for financial institutions as well as uh, investment, etc. And I think Qatar is an extremely proud uh, uh, country, and we want to show that we can, we can uh, uh, meet these targets that we've, if you like, set ourselves with the 2022 World Cup, etc., and performance. Um, also, just coming back, there is much that we can do with materials uh, as well. Um, sequestered CO2, uh, we've done a number of studies uh, looking at um, uh, the use of timber in construction in, in, in the UK. And we've found that taking various scenarios about end of life, uh, you actually end up with a negative CO2 uh, uh, value. That's not other environmental impacts, but if you just focus on CO2. And there are a number of construction systems, not least of which uh, 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 Mariam is, is exploring at, at Qatar University where we may find similar CO2 sequestration going on. Uh, and if you write that large for, the, for, if you like, a material used extensively, then again, we can do much to, to uh, uh, capture and reduce that CO2. So I think that there is a great deal of, of concern about upsetting the economic uh, e equilibrium, and I think there are real social concerns and, and indeed dangers that, that, that Holly uh, pointed out. But there is much that we can do actually that is creative uh, in terms of uh, uh, economic instruments. Uh, and I think that those are the drivers that you, uh, we didn't really overlook them, we just weren't asked. Thank you, Alex. Just terms of, uh, of uh, economic terms as well as really technical terms and you t uh, touch down on the, on the issues of economics, it's really it's important when you look at the, the consumption patterns, it's all ultimately an economic you know, uh, problem. Both the government and the consumer can understand exactly how the economics is working and how he builds the the house that will be affect his, his budget end of the day, it's really, uh, you know, th this is how he should feel. And the, the, the awareness and all of that, it will really comes once he st start to feel that he's mm -hmm. going to pay more, so he's going to build a house that's more effective. Uh, I, I want to use, the, uh, you know, an example from the region, but uh, I want to say that the Building codes now is really based on the performance of the buildings, rather than the, you know, the per square meter, if you like, of uh, energy consumed. Now the, the new version of the the Gulf, if you, if you like, the the Gulf uh, uh, codes is going to be built on the performance of the building, whether it's being built, uh, you know, from the architecture point of view, or uh, or even uh, the uh, or from the building uh, building materials choices or even from the indoor air quality. So, uh, fil uh, infiltration and filtration and, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, all of these aspects really constitutes the, the code. In the old days in the, in the Gulf region, they used to build really tr uh, traditional houses. That's really, in my opinion, they are more, more efficient, energy efficient. We used to have this, this tall, uh, tall structure, it's like, uh, we call it a wind, a wind uh, uh, bad gear, it's a wind uh, tunnel actually, that catches air from every, every direction. But look how the uh, smart people they used to, to be. They used to bring the, you know, the, the shells from the sea, collect all of this and crush it. Because of what is it? It's a, a no? It's a, it's a, it's a, yeah. 
and they used to plus. And I just want to finish this. I want to finish this. Uh, this is important because this type, once they plaster the the the, the, you know, the tower with it inside, it absorbs the the uh, you know absorbs the moisture that comes with this. Then they are solving problems. So we look at the, the basic materials exactly like uh, my colleague in here said, but at the same time uh, the the bl uh, building performance is right. Uh, so that uh, Qatar University, uh, head of mechanical and uh, industrial department. I mean, following following on on the on the tower, we've got a funded research by QNRF to look at passive building ventilators. But on the tower, we are incorporating heat pipes as novel technology and uh, and. Uh, an absorption uh, cycle, so it's been it's been funded already on the first cycle by QNRF. But I mean, uh, culture and how we can use the building and utilize the building. This can be solved using smart technology, control. You know, uh, you can walk into the system, into the building, and lights will switch on and off depending on the usage. But what I want to bring to the panel that using of multifunctional building. I mean, this building today, after the convention, um, will shut for next week or in ten days' time when we have the. World Petroleum Congress. But between now and then, air conditioning will be on. Maybe at lower base, but will be on to maintain certain <coughs> levels of temperature. But using a building which is multifunctional. So after this, um, uh, we can use it as a cinema, as a mall, as whatever. Then, then this will, will bring something to the table. And we're looking hard. I mean, the department now is collaborating with the 2022, designing the tennis stadiums for Qatar. We are looking what is going to happen to this building after the event, and we're looking at multifunctional stadiums. So maybe this is something that we need to work further uh, on. It's not only just controls, not only where we generate the, uh, the energy and use it, but how we can uh, bring the buildings to be multifunctional dependent on the event and, and increase use. Thank you. Please. Uh, excuse me. We're on this side, please. The next door. Yeah, well, I think I have to. Not after that. Okay, yes, sir. In GCC, we have from 60 to 70 percent of the power generated used for the air conditioning. The question now what is the air conditioning cover? What is the load air conditioning cover? Sensible heat and latent heat for the whole building include all the equipment, human, material, furniture, color of the wool and the carpet, everything in the building. What does that mean? If I don't have a standard for each single equipment inside the country imported, that means, by the way, any machine has efficiency depending on the minimum and the maximum temperature, low and high temperature. Everybody study thermodynamics understand that very well. So if I can control Whatever machine operates in GCC, it will be fit the environmental parameters. We know there is three parameters. So we call it operating parameters, design parameters, environmental parameters. If it doesn't fit GCC standard, that means I'm losing my energy. So where we are from that label for each machine, is it saving and how much amount of consumption Energy it will save. Okay, Tom will direct the same thing with the material. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I, I could maybe say a few words about this. Yeah, please. Uh, I, I think all the, the, the appliances now do have something we call Energy Star. So they are labeled in a sense. If you look at the, you know, when you buy the, the appliance made in the US or in Europe, you could see the efficiency being rated on that. I think our question is that there was the HVAC system. Because those performance, like I mentioned earlier, goes very well down with the ambient temperature. And they should be tested by an independent lab, which we do not have right now in the region. So again, it's a call for, for, for the center to establish something like that. All right. Thank you, Walid. We have two questions, one there and one over there. So we'll start. Uh, this question follows on the discussion. It's for Dr. Merriam, actually. Um, following on the discussion of the uh, kind of old knowledge in terms of building that is good for this region. And um, when I was recently in Oman, I saw a lot of uh, older buildings that are made from dirt, basically dirt, and which you seem to have a lot of, <laughs> and uh, rocks and 
straw, and I was just wondering, um, are you doing any work looking into uh, sort of modernizing that ancient technique um, in a way that can be widely applied? At the moment, but I know that um, Sherib, which is a part of Qatar Foundation, is doing uh, and demolishing actually the heart of Doha and initiating a new heart. Maybe you visited Sukhwakov. Uh, this is a kind of materials from dirt and local rocks here in Qatar. And the whole city center, uh, Doha Hearts, I think the name is Doha Hearts, is, uh, will be uh, developed from totally local materials and with the zero, um, uh, it will uh, maybe minus also efficient uh, production of CO2. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Alam. I am uh, founder of Saudi Environmental Society and founder for Alam for Environment Global. I would like to say, regardless where we are, we are before anything, we are the, we are the citizen of the globe. And it's not a beauty contest to, to have uh, interventions when things are abused for many reasons. And I don't want to talk about a lot of things, but as a citizen of the globe, I would like to share an idea. The economics. A lot of people decline from the green building because of the economics. But you can make a simple green building from common sense. For instance, in this country or in this region, it's hot. So the exposure the, of the area that can, lose, that can lose AC should be minimum to the sun. And it should be facing the winter sun. That's just an example. Why do you have so much glass? Why do you have so much interior design in which we have so much space? And we waste so much uh, energy. I think it's, it's a matter of decoration sometimes versus reality and efficiency. Anyway, who is guilty? Is it us or the building? And I think we have to have integrated build, uh, green building solution. And actually, I hope also that uh, the building, when we talk about, about the building, not only the design, the construction, the operation, and the monitoring, and the evaluation, and the upgrade. We have to take. We have to. We have to change, not only our habit, our operation way. There is so much that can be done to have integrated green building, and actually, if you like, let's say integrated green planning. Thank you very much. Thank you, the gentleman there. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Sinan al -Ubaydi. I'm a former uh, Texas A&M student. And I'm an uh, electrical engineer at Mushar Properties. We can't hear the Lampkins. Um, I would like just to make a comment uh, that uh, Qatar is a blessed country uh, with a lot of energy and resources. Uh, imposing uh, tariffs or taxes or uh, uh, those kind of regulation on this country uh, with, with such a little population is not the, 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 the idea of this forum or having such activities. Behind, behind this, we need to uh, educate more people and deal with their behaviors to how to consume power uh, and energy. And I think this is the main concern uh, that the, the leaders of this country should have at this point uh, because it's, uh, it's very critical. It's a de developing country. It's uh, boosting up. And there is a lot of projects. Uh, from my, our part, as uh, part, being part of Mushair Properties, um, as the director said, uh, that uh, we're building the Heart of Doha project. And it's a completely uh, sustainable project. Uh, it's a LEED certified, uh, it's following all the international regulations uh, in buildings, it's turning uh, back the history of Qatar to a new modern way, uh, and it's all green. So uh, having such initiatives in the country 
uh, tells me that we are going toward the right direction, but it's it's progressing within time. Um, that's what I want. Thank you. Uh, we have the time actually for concluding a question. Let's go there. My name is uh, Mohammed Belkhiyat. I am uh, based in Washington, D.C. and my background is in energy and uh, renewable energy. What I would like to say is that I am literally astonished that there is a seven gigawatt swing in the summer months for AC. It is just huge. And I would like to commend Qatar for stopping here and saying, What's going on? What can we do about this uh, for, for AC? This is just tremendous. The fact that you actually are stopping here and asking the question is just wonderful. I also want to put things in perspective. Do we know whether that seven gigawatts is going to AC alone or is it going to water production such as desalination? Do we have a measurement for that decoupling? So I'd like to ask that because in the summer months, you may use a little bit more water than the, the, uh, the, the usual. Uh, the other uh, uh, thing I'd like to put in perspective is that uh, seven gigawatts is actually more than the installed power of my home country, Morocco, which is 35 million people. So I'd like to just let you know, not to say that you shouldn't be doing this, but to just put things in perspective. I also know in the United States, we use a lot more energy than the rest of the world per person. But this is wonderful that you're asking the question, sure. why and what can we do about it? Sure. The other thing I want to say or ask is, are we looking at things like production of ice during the night? Because in the cool hours of the night, you can uh, produce ice a lot easier than during the day, and you can blow cold uh, uh, air through the ice to provide uh, cooling to the building. The other uh, question I would like to see if the, if the universities are doing anything in this area of, of using, for example, ice uh, solutions. The other solution is to use thermal pumps, underground thermal pumps that you can uh, blow air or other mediums through so that you are able to use the underground temperature, 150 deep or so, to cool the building because the temperature underground is stable and you can use that cool buildings or the city, in fact, uh, why not do a study to do that on a, a much larger scale for the entire city, from the, from the winter months to the summer months. And thank, Th you. thank you very much. Maybe John have something to add about the AC consumption. Uh, on, on AC consumption, I don't, have, I don't have a good number off the top of my head for the country as a whole. There is a huge swing, obviously, because of the, uh, the unitary equipment. Um, my bill has got 24 tons of installed air conditioning on it. It's 300 square meters. It's insane. Um, that's what was provided by my university. Uh, everybody in our compound, there's 160 houses or villas in our compound. Every, they're identical. And every compound, every house has 24 tons of cooling. Uh, it's like a 27 kW peak in the summer with that, that kind of system. Uh, the same size house in the United States would be maybe a 5 ton system or, you know, or two two, three ton system, something like that, not 24 ton. Uh, there is, what I've observed and just from the design side um, is a tremendous uh, oversizing of, of everything. Uh, if this facility, if, if it's a, a 10,000 ton load for this building, I'm betting it's sized for 20,000 tons. I, I, I'd almost bet on it. Uh, our building is oversized by twice for the thermal capacity in our building. So it, it is, it's a huge, like a compounding problem uh, with the, the demand side. As far as thermal storage, I've not seen anything, anybody where, there, there may be, Cutter Cool, Cutter Cool, well Cutter Cool has some thermal storage, and that's on very, very large scale, but nothing like individual, individual buildings, ice storage, or uh, you know, chill water storage. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, I, 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 have to, I have to say that we've recently looked at a project for a, for a school in, in, in Doha, which uh, the uh, M&E consultant is, is using ground, walls, ground uh, source heat pump and uh, uh, looking at ice production during the uh, uh, the um, uh, night, and uh, 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 and then uh, utilising that during the day, and uh, the, the the 
I think the consensus is that there is ample opportunity for what we call mixed mode uh, systems to be developed within Qatar and indeed the, 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 the Gulf region generally. We've got five beautiful months uh, of, of very temperate weather uh, uh, here uh, that really uh, we must not ignore. Uh, that, that really, <coughs> and I have to say that, that I'm probably guilty a, a, as well of just continuing on this air conditioning living mode when really uh, we, we should be have designing buildings where we can switch off and actually use a mixed mode system. And those, those techniques are, are, are well developed and well understood. We just need to bring them here. Well, I thank you. I think you yeah, have something to add. Okay, I would like to thank the panelists and thank you all for being here. I'm sure there are a lot more to be said, but you can, I mean, uh, ask them directly after the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And I will add to what Fahad says, but I'm going to remind you of the goal that we started with. In the one, panel one, after finishing the discussion, Her Highness send us a message. You're not leaving this room until you give me some action items. And, I'm, and again, again, I'm going to ask Fahad and the panels to really do the same. So you're not leaving this room. We've got an hour and a half before the, uh, the dinner. And I really would like us to see a consensus on a, some, some document that will help us move forward in terms of an integrated research activity. The discussion I heard today is fascinating. The interest in the group is fascinating. And what makes it really more interesting is that multidisciplinarity that, that was really shown. Uh, from, from the, so one thing that I, uh, uh, like the tug of war between the indoor air quality and the energy efficiency, the tug of war between material and design, uh, really this is fascinating. So if we can capture that momentum just today and help us put together a, a, a guideline, a roadmap on how do we move forward, because this is a very important area. And as you look around, uh, we have a, a national partners, we've got regional partners, and we've got international partners. I really want to want to kind of uh, uh, hold on to that opportunity and see if we can come together and have a statement that help put a, a road map with all the expertise here. So thank you so much, and I'm counting on uh, Fahad to to help uh, uh, guide us through that discussion. So thank you so much. <laughs>